Lumpur, um, another question was two concepts that you see more frequently in the Mahayana is the concept of um, the bardo as that place between death and life as a place where awakening can really occur. And um, another is the idea of a direct transmission mind to mind from a teacher to a student. Yeah. I've never really seen these echoed as much in the Theravada, but I'm curious what your opinion is of these two ideas. And if you do find any support either in your own, what you've heard about or in the texts. Okay, well, it, take them one at a time. They, the bardo, uh, the inter, intermediate state, <clears throat> that has actually, there's, there is actually quite a controversy about whether there is an antara bawa, that would be the poly for intermediate state, whether there's an intermediate state in, uh, in the, uh, the original um, poly texts. The, the, what I, I like to call kind of um, high church, high church Theravada, which is, you know, Abhidhamma and commentaries, Buddha Gosa, they denies any Antara Bawa. The Abhidhamma theory, orthodox theory is that the moment of death is immediately followed by the moment of birth. There's no intermediate state, but that has never been popular uh, with ordinary Buddhists anywhere, that idea. And um, there's, there's a, there have been, uh, there, I'm trying to remember who wrote, I think it was Paul Harvey wrote, um, one of the Buddhist academics, I'm pretty sure it was Harvey, um, uh, wrote a, uh, a long essay on um, the Antara Bawa in Theravada and found various references. One is the Gandaba seeking rebirth. And the other one is a passage in, um, I think it's in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, talking about the different kinds of anagamis. Oh, when an anagami um, attains the arahantship and some of them attain it in the interval is the, uh, the word. And that can be interpreted as before taking rebirth in the in the Sukhavati, the after death, but before rebirth. So that would mean there is a time between. So there is some, I mean, it's controversial and it can and it's a matter of interpretation, but there is some room to see an uh, intermediate state in Theravada. As for mind-to-mind -mind transmission. I don't think you really find that in uh, in Theravada. Uh, there's always been an emphasis on even the Buddha said, you know, uh, you know, make your own way, right? You have to do your own work. That you can't, um, it can't be gifted to you. As much as a teacher can help and guide, you know, the the, the interior work has to be done by the practitioner. Well, if we're speaking about that interior work, um, the concept of, uh, well, actually before that, on the Ant Antara Bhava state, there's a few instances in the suttas where um, a, a disciple will take the knife and then be declared blameless. Yeah. And I've always been curious if that was an arhant committing suicide or yeah. someone on the verge of committing suicide or uh, of being an arhant dying yeah. And then right when they right when they die, attaining our hardship and therefore being blameless. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I I would also share your um, uncertainty about that point. I don't think it's clear in the text. Uh, I would lean to the idea that they attained our hardship immediately before taking the knife, but I don't think that's absolutely certain. Uh, one more long pour uh, from me and then Ajahn Kobil, I'm sure as many. Um, I'm curious, the concept of stream entry is, you know, fairly controversial in the West in terms of exactly how easy it is. I mean, I know we all have heard the passages from Sarakani where the Buddha says that even if even these, if these trees understand. Uh, your internet froze. I think it's a problem at your end. Yeah, I think. Hmm? Yeah, uh, your your trans internet transmission froze on me for a second. I think the problem at your end because my mind seems to be uninterrupted. 
You're right. How about now, Longport? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, no, now it's now it's clear, but I missed uh, I missed uh, that question. You so, um, in the West, I think there's some controversy around the concept of stream entry, where uh, you know the passages on Sarkhani seem to where the Buddha says that if these trees were understood what was ill and well said, I would declare even them stream enterers, you know, can be interpreted to mean in such a way that I think some people do overestimate themselves. Mm. Um, whereas others, I think, believe it's completely, you know, something that's unattainable. Right. Um, how would one know if one had attained stream entry? What would one remember? Um, what are the what are your thoughts on this whole realm? Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, that is an important question, and one that comes up often because uh, there is uh, a lot of um, possibility for overestimation. A lot of powerful experiences can happen in meditation, but they're not necessarily stream entry. Um, I like the the uh, it's a very traditional way of testing is to examine the mind for the three fetters and that would require first of all clearly understanding what those fetters are and not uh, you know and and this is another another um, area where translation becomes problematic because we have personality in english personality view right and ritual clinging and skeptical doubt and all of those translations that could can be misinterpreted or or misleading. So it would require a bit of study to clarify what what you actually mean by those um, those terms, and then to examine the mind again and again for any trace of those those fetters. Yeah, in uh, one of your recent talks on uh, about those fetters, the three fetters in particular to to stream entry, the mm -hmm. one on uh, uh, sila bhatta paramasa, so attachment to rites and rituals, you had a somewhat a, a, a pretty novel and interesting insight uh, that um, obsessive compulsive disorder is perhaps you know an extreme manifestation of this attachment to mm -hmm. rites and rituals. I, I found that quite fascinating. Um, just in listening to those talks and in other of your talks, I've been quite impressed with um, how uh, how detailed and how referenced and and systematic uh, I've found your talks. And I'm curious what kind of preparation you do for uh, these talks on a particular theme. There's you know some ethos in in some sections of the you know, Western students of Ajahn Chah, you know, mm -hmm. that one should just always be extemporaneous and yeah. not have any notes. And I'm curious. No, I uh, don't, I generally don't do a, a little or no preparation. I, I've studied all this stuff before. And I may, I may, uh, if it's, a, if it's going to be a more technical talk, like if I'm going to do a talk on dependent origination or something like that, I may, I may, uh, you know, go over some material beforehand but generally generally it's pretty it's pretty off the cuff i might think about it a bit before the talk i generally don't write anything down well i'm surprised to hear that yeah they they come across as very very organized and, and structured so that's impressive that you can do that in real time um as you are so you say you you think about them perhaps a bit a bit before the talk while you're while you're reading and, and studying, obviously you've you've read a lot both in of Pali literature, which has been translated and not in the original Pali and uh, in translation, uh, and many many other uh, genre of books. It seems. Um, do you take notes or have a way of um, structuring your your knowledge base um, as you're processing new information? So do you do you take notes or? It depends what I'm doing. Um, generally, no, but like when I was researching the uh, Buddhist cosmos, I did take extensive notes and um, had, I had on my computer, you know, files of 
you know, different categories of where, where I had references to things. Um, and then I'd go, go back to that and, you know, try to put them in order and make, make sense of them. Um, for, you know, I, you've remained in robes for a long time and, um, you know, I really honor that. I'd be curious about some of the, if you'd be willing to speak to, you know, for the sake of all of us who are still moving through the holy life and this practice in general, how you've dealt, what dark valleys you have had and how you moved through them and remained um, in the holy life for so many decades. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I I, I don't think I, I've, uh, I've had that big of a, a struggle with it. Um, I ordained relatively late in life. I was 35. And in some ways, I thought that's kind of a sweet spot because uh, often uh, men who ordain very young, then they have, you know, they're still too full of passions of life and it make a difficult adjustment that way. And if they are deemed too old, they're they're too set in their ways. You know, they become it becomes difficult in another direction. Uh, I, was, I was kind of uh, early middle age. I ordained, and I, I'm 66 now. Um, uh, the only time I think that I seriously thought about this role being was in my third year as a monk. I was finding it. I I was just finding it difficult dealing with. Uh, dealing with the structure and dealing with the the um the, the routine and so on it wasn't a, it wasn't so much discontent or wanting to return to the world but just feeling a bit constrained but i got through that and you know i've never really seriously seriously uh looked at this robing after that You had in your biography reading about how you had been interested in in Buddhism or in, in spiritual practice meditation even before ordaining yes. before going to Thailand. I'm curious. Uh, I, I wasn't able to find much information about Kema Ananda. Be yeah. curious if you could speak about about him a bit. Okay, Kema Ananda. His uh, lay name was Eric James Bell. He was a Canadian born in Winnipeg, and uh, uh, he had ordained uh, and at some point, and he was uh, before I knew him, and he was um, uh, a monk for, for a short time, like I think a year or two. And he told me that it was impossible in the early days when he ordained, which would have been like the 1960s or early 60s. He said that there was no support structure and it was just too difficult. And, uh, so he, when I knew him, he was a, a lay teacher, but he kept the name of Kema Nanda. Uh, he had studied with um, a, a fairly well-known uh, teacher in, in Tibetan Buddhist circles, uh, Namjal Rinpoche. Um, he, was, uh, he was a Scots man. Uh, I forget his I forget his lay name. Uh, and he had been a Theravada monk originally. His first uh, ordination was as a Theravada monk with the name uh, Ananda Bodhi. And he had, he was, uh, he, he's well known to the English Sangha because he was associated early on with the English Sangha Trust before the Ajahn Chah monks got involved. And uh, at some point, he switched traditions to Tibetan tradition and, and uh, took the name Nanjal, Namjal Rinpoche. And Kema was studying under him in the Dharma Center of Canada, which is still going. It's north of Peterborough. Um, at around the time, he was switching traditions. So Kema had a, a base in his teaching was based in Theravada, but he also had Tibetan stuff. Like we used to do in when um, when I was under studying under Kema, we used to do Tibetan chanting quite often. 
um, and he talked about Padma Sambhava and, you know, the, so he had some, you know, he had some still a strong interest in Tibetan Buddhism. Well, Mpur, I think we uh, have to let you go in a few minutes. Okay. Um, maybe just one question and a half, um, if that's all right. I, I'm curious about the, um, Ajahn Amaro has said, has noticed how strange it is that in the Pali Suttas you find no monk asking the Buddha how one becomes like the Buddha. And Ajahn Amaro's theory was that perhaps the later people had, um, once the tension between the Mahayana and Theravada had become prominent, that perhaps certain parts of the canon were actually excised that had to do with the Bodhisattva path. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that idea. Um, and the second question is, we're supposed to ask you about the bear. Oh, okay. um, well, I don't know the, which bear I don't know someone told the, us to ask about there's a, a yeah. bear story perhaps about a bear that came to the monastery well, and yeah was released or you you told oh you yeah 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 well this is this is a, a well-known anecdote that that there was a bear making trouble here and we phoned the um the ministry of natural resources telling them we have a tr problem bear that keeps getting into the garbage can you send someone over to live trap the bear and they said certainly sir we'll we'll send somebody over um, where do you live and we told them and there was a silence on the other end and then the the, the guy said uh that's where we release the bears <laughs> so, um the more serious question about the bodhisattva path there is actually a text uh, um in the the commentarial uh layer that Bhikkhu Bodhi has translated, and you can find it in um, as an appendix to one of his uh, translated. You know, he's got these little books put out by Wheel that translate a, a sutta and commentaries. Yeah, a treatise on the Parami. I believe so. Parami I believe Allah. that's what it is. Where he he I believe that's what he titled it. Yeah, um, and that deals with the Bodhisattva path in in. Uh, Theravada and emphasizes how difficult it is and what a great act of compassion it is to determine to practice through Buddhahood so there you know there there was that at least in the commentarial period there was that um, that awareness of that that uh, that possible path one more okay one more came to mind I'm sorry um yeah. Uh, I actually do you have 60 seconds more yeah 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 we got a mic seven minutes I think okay um the the Buddha's omniscience I, I know there's a lot of question I mean I think there's agreement that he couldn't know all things at all times yeah but there may be some idea that he could know anything at one time or there's right. a confused topic. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that was how that was how the commentarial tradition settled on the question in the end. After there was apparently some controversy, you can see it in the in the commentarial discussion. There was some back and forth about what the Buddha's omniscience actually meant, and the uh, the formula that was settled on was that the Buddha did not know all things at all times, but he could know anything he wanted if he put his mind to it example would be like the number of fish in the Ganges River. He didn't go around with that knowledge, but if ever for any reason he wanted to know, he could just direct his mind to that question and he'd have the answer. But I, to me, all the, those questions are kind of fruitless because we can't, we can't know the mind of a Buddha. So trying to define exactly what the limits of a Buddha's mind are is uh, it's a, a fruitless, impossible task Ajahn, since we have uh six minutes or so uh i am curious you you've done so much study and uh i'm, I'm curious if you could explain or, or talk about the role that that study has played in your uh in your in your life in the longevity of your your life do you think it's a is it an accident that you've been able to stick around so long um you know, is is your your study related to that? Does does your study bring you joy in a sense that uh, um, 
Yeah. How does your study relate to your practice? Yeah, well, uh, I think it makes it rich, richer. You know, it's like a, it's a whole, um, once you get into looking into uh, the, the literature of, of Buddhism, it's, it's vast, you know, it's like inexhaustible. And it's such a rich mine of, uh, of, of Dhamma. And, you know, it keeps just endlessly, it keeps refreshing. So, so that has, you know, that, that has been a, a, yeah, a source of joy and a source of uh, inspiration. Yeah. Longpore, um, thank you so much for taking this time. We really appreciate it. I was referencing one of our supporters earlier who found your YouTube channel and told, said that you were Theravada's best kept secret and we're very appreciative of the material you've been putting out and have been keeping up with all of it. So thank you so much for your guidance, for the time, for, for everything. Okay, you're very welcome. Can I ask you, uh, where, where are you located? We're in Seattle uh, on the okay. Kitsap Peninsula. Um, and yeah, I just moved here about seven months ago. So we go for alms every morning at a Pike Place Market. And yeah, that's where we are at the moment. Okay. That's that's Tan Nisibo. I'm I'm only here temporarily. I I will be moving here hopefully permanently in a couple of years, but I'm attending the Dharma Realm Buddhist University near Abayagiri in California. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's um the city of ten thousand Buddhas place. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I know that I've been there several times. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have do you have any advice for us as young sort of uppity majimas slash terras but not really uppity we're just doing something a bit out of the way and yeah, no, just keep uh, just keep uh, keep the faith keep doing what you're doing and um don't uh, don't let yourself be too overcome by the ups and downs don't get too elated when things go well and don't be downcast when you have difficulties just deal with it day by day thank you so much Ajahn. yeah i hope you have a good day good rest of your day you too Bye now.